Yeah, so global climate patterns are largely determined by the input of solar energy and the planet's movement in space. One thing I don't know if you've noticed this about particularly Vancouverites, maybe this is common all over the world, I don't know. It's common in Australia too, is that everybody seems to be somewhat obsessed with weather. <laughs> you know, I went out with a guy once and he looked at the weather uh, predictions like every day and really delved into it. it. Found it so fascinating. And you really, you can't meet anyone without talking about the weather, right? Isn't that like almost the first thing in conversation that comes up? Oh, how's the weather today? <laughs> Or, you know, what do you think of all that rain we've been having or something like that? And it's funny because in Vancouver, uh, there's such large changes, even daily in weather. I don't know if you've noticed lately, but there's, there's fog out there today that makes the air cold and humid. Um, but, the, but the sun's breaking through, the, the sky is getting blue and pretty soon it will be super warm. It all happens quite quickly, and there's and there's a similar patterns. Similar patterns happen in Australia. So I was in Melbourne, Australia, for a little while, and um, and there was a saying that was, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes because it'll change. And I swear, one time that what time of year? I think it was November. There, which is getting to be their summer. Within two days, it was 17 degrees one day and 43 degrees the next day Celsius. It was so hot. I don't know if you've ever experienced 43 degrees, but it is sweltering. And it's humid there as well. And the only place that in the whole family that there was an air conditioner was in the parents' one room. <laughs> so the whole family went to um, my partner's parents' place and watched soccer and cricket for, until it got cooler again. Anyway, so, so weather can change very quickly, but it's largely determined by the sun. So these are global patterns. For example, intensity. Now, when would you expect, I'll put on the chat, when would you expect the sun to be more intense? When it's directly overhead or when it's at an angle? When would you think the sunlight would be more intense if it's directly overhead or if it's at an angle? Directly overhead? Yeah, good, directly overhead, yes. Yes, it's much more intense. And the one place on Earth where the sun is directly overhead um, most of the time, well, pretty much all the time, is the equator. So the Earth tilts, you know, say, Say this is the equator here, the Earth tilts this way and that way, but not at the equator. There's no tilting away from the sun at the equator. So if you're at the equator, um, the sun is directly overhead, that makes it pretty warm, but also pretty much gets light. Sunrise is at 6 a.m. and sunset is at 6 p.m. So the daylight hours are the same as well. So latitudinally, if we go further north, um, the angle of the sun gets to be more acute. It gets to be more acute because the sun isn't directly overhead anymore. And also it depends on the tilt of the earth, how severe that angle is. So that seasonal variation in sunlight intensity leads to uh, various daylight hours. So at the March equinox, the equator faces the sun directly. Neither pole is tilted toward the sun. And all regions on Earth have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. That's the mark, March equinox. In December, what happens here in December? Which, which is longer, the nighttime or the daytime in December? The nighttime, yeah, so it gets to be in the northern hemisphere, we tilt away from the sun. So our winter begins, but also our period of darkness gets longer. In September, it's the equinox. Again, neither pole tilts towards the sun, so there's 12 hours of 
daylight, 12, hour, 12 hours of darkness. And then the June solstice, well, the northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun. Summer begins, woohoo, which we're always all very happy about. <laughs> and the days get longer, which is terrific. Now, I've always thought it would be a good idea to live here in our summer and go and live in Australia in their summer, just to have those long days. So sun, big influence. Air circulation and wind patterns. And wind patterns are largely determined by the Earth's movement. The, Earth, the Earth's movement, which causes water movement, which causes currents, which influences wind. So there are, um, uh, what are they called again? Not pockets. There's another word for them. Uh, cells. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> cells. Cells of wind patterns whereby uh, ascending air, um, moist air goes upward, descending air absorbs the moisture, it gets drier. And also, moisture from some latitudes travels further north or further south and condenses there and drops rain at latitudes that are, that are in a distance. And wind patterns are predictable for the most part around the world. So here, for example, we often get westerlies. Westerlies, which means that the wind comes from the west. So when the wind comes from the west here, uh, generally it brings cooler air because it's coming off the ocean. But we also get easterlies when that changes. In some places called the doldrums, there is no wind or very little wind. So sailing ships have to be careful they don't get caught in the doldrums. Um, yeah. So global wind patterns. Around the Antarctic, there are currents that began with wind. The continent broke off from Australia. And after it broke off from Australia, a current started to form around the entire continent of Antarctica. And it cut off warmer water from other more southerly oceans. And that is why Antarctica is all snow and ice today, because it doesn't get any warm currents that's cut off from the rest of the oceans. So local features of landscape also influence our weather, of course, like mountains do considerably. And Globally, there is a trend. Of course, climate is warming. So warming, how much has it warmed? About one degrees, I think. One degree Celsius. I don't know, it depends who you talk to, but it is definitely warming more than you would expect background warming to be. And that has caused things like uh, perennial sea ice to decline. So this is the Arctic. And the Arctic ice is not on a continent. It's, it's floating, floating ice. And the way somebody found that out a long time ago was Explorer. I don't remember the name, but they basically had a ship. And the ship got um, frozen into the ice in one place. And they wanted to see if they would travel on the ice, if the ice would move them. And, and it did move them considerably. I think this expedition was five years. Uh, it wasn't very successful, unfortunately, for some of the people on board. So there was some fatalities on board as food got to be more and more scarce. But it did show that the Arctic indeed is not on a continent. It's um, floating. But perennial means ice that is there all year round. So this was the size of the ice all year round back in 1980. And this is the size now, well, in 2012, maybe a little bit smaller now, I'm not really sure. So that has declined as a result of uh, global warming. 
oceans and currents and even large lakes and currents like any of the Great Lakes. The, um, um, what were the names of those large lakes that we looked at, the, at that in that video? There was uh, Malawi, Victoria. What was the other one? Baikal? Baikal. They're large enough lakes to act somewhat like oceans when it comes to currents. Um, so that affects precipitation, temperature, humidity, of course. Uh, water or air rather uh, moves inland, it rises up with warmth and it cools at high elevations. The um, clouds tend to condense there and air tends to sink over water as it's cooler. The mountain's effects are such that a mountain close to the coast or even as far away as the Rocky Mountains will trap moisture. So this side of the Rocky Mountains and the Kootenays, the Kootenays is all lakes and there can be quite a lot of rain in the Kootenays. Also on this side of the coast mountains, there's a lot of rain, but between the coast mountains and you know, before you get to the, to the Rockies in the Okanagan area, it's super hot and super dry. So the reason for that is that the moisture that gets um, evaporated from the oceans travels inland by westerlies, westerly winds, and then it doesn't get too much further than the mountains, which is where it tends to condense and fall. And that's why you get some very warm uh, wind on the other side of the mountains, like the Chinook winds in, in Alberta. So the angle of the sun changes with the time of year as the earth itself tilts. Or I should say that the tilt of the earth is such that either the northern hemisphere is closer to the sun or further away from the sun. It's further away from the sun, the angle tends to be more acute. And you can see that because you can see that the sun is further down in the horizon. So that tells you how much it will heat the surface. If it's at an acute angle, it won't heat the surface all that much. And therefore we have seasons. So that's why we have our fall with the beautiful leaves, winter with the fantastic snow to ski on, um, spring with the lovely blossoms in the trees, and of course summer where you're gonna surf in Tofino. Maybe. So lakes change considerably also with seasonal temperature. Uh, lakes, so these are, di these are different um, pictures of lakes, but on the side you'll see graphs, and these are depth graphs. So, they, so this, I'll make that a bit larger, sorry. This axis is the depth of the lake, and this x-axis will be something else. In this case, it's dissolved oxygen. So you can see what happens to dissolved oxygen at, at depth at different times of the year. So in the spring, um, there's generally winds that cause a turnover in the lake, and the lake will then be pretty much a similar temperature from top to bottom. And the same thing happens in autumn. In autumn, there's stronger winds and the winds cause the lake water to be turned over. So the temperature is fairly even from top to bottom. In winter, uh, often on lakes in British Columbia, there is a layer of ice. And so the temperature of the water is cold at the top, but down below it's at four degrees Celsius. So in a lake, the temperature at the greatest depths is four degrees Celsius. And that's because as the water starts to freeze, um, it gets closer to four degrees, then some crystals form and the crystals rise to the surface. So the water at depth remains at about four degrees Celsius. Um, in summer, there is a thermocline about here. 
This is showing a thermocline, whereby it's still four degrees Celsius at the bottom of the lake, but because of the sun hitting the, the water, it's warmer at the top here. It shows 22 degrees. But there's wind in the summer, and it turns. Uh, can you see this OK? Let me make that wider. I'm just going to erase that last one and do this in red. So there may be a wind that's causing a current in the lake. It hits the end of the lake, and the current returns underneath, like so. This causes a continual current on the surface, but cold air is dense, or cold water, sorry, is denser, so it doesn't penetrate the thermocline. The thermocline is the boundary between the warm water at the top, up here, and the cooler water below, down here. So that's a thermocline. And oxygen tends to change as well. So, of course, when the water is evenly distributed, the dissolved oxygen is the same from the surface to depth. But in winter and in spring, the dissolved oxygen gets very low at depth. And um, one of the reasons is in the summer, the dissolved oxygen is low because a lot of it is taken up by benthic organisms that live down here. And in the winter, it's just that the water is uh, at a temperature whereby um, it doesn't allow for a lot of dissolved oxygen. So microclimate. We looked a little bit at microclimate. Those are very fine scale differences at a, a local level, at a very small a local level. So these are rocks. If you, if you get to Lighthouse Park or any of our parks that have rock formations like this, you can go and look at the different types of mosses. And there will be maybe up to 10 or 12 different species of mosses and lichens. And that's because there are parts of these rocks that are a bit drier. So this might be a bit drier, so lichens grow there. There are parts that are very wet that collect water, and a different kind of moss will grow there. So there's a distribution of different species depending on the amount of moisture and the amount of sunlight that different areas of these um, microhabitats get. So biomes are really, really large ecosystems. They're influenced by abiotic and biotic factors, of course. Um, and aquatic biomes, that's what we're looking at first. But even terrestrial biomes are influenced strongly, of course, by abiotic and biotic factors. And they're the biomes are the major types of ecological associations. They're very broad, very large geographic regions of land or water. So we looked at freshwater already as one biome. Um, we're breaking it down to different kinds of water, lakes, coral reefs, rivers, ocean pelagic zone, that's where you can swim, basically, estuaries at the mouth of rivers, intertidal zones, and the abyssal zone, which is below the pelagic zone. So that's uh, the deepest part of the ocean. And so this map shows where all of those various biomes are. Of course, they're very large. Oceans themselves cover 75% of the Earth's surface, so they have an enormous influence on the entire biosphere. So we saw in the lakes that they're, they're somewhat stratified. Here's a further uh, um, examples of stratification. So it depends how far light can penetrate. So in lakes and the ocean, light penetrates only to a certain depth before it, all the wavelengths are absorbed. And that's called the photic zone. And certain organisms live in the photic zone. So this is the ocean, and this is the photic zone of the ocean. <clears throat> 
just where light can penetrate. Um, the study of freshwater and particularly lakes is called limnology. So the limnetic zone is the zone whereby most of the um, basically swimming organisms are. The littoral zone is closer to shore and that's where you'll find emergent plants. So those are emergent plants. Plants that can live in this zone because it's so shallow. So they root in the soil in the bottom of the lake, but they emerge from the top through photosynthesis. Generally, the pelagic zone is the area that's not the benthic zone. The benthic zone is the bottom of a lake or an ocean. That's where there's generally a mud, sediments, and benthic organisms. In particular, many different kinds of uh, insect larvae. And in some cases, um, salamanders as well, and different kinds of animals. So in the ocean, you have, you have similar kinds of designations, the pelagic zone, which is the swimming zone. Oh, and I guess I forgot to mention that the aphotic zone, that's where light does not penetrate. So you won't find photosynthetic organisms there. Uh, the benthic zone, which is where the sediments and the mud collect, that's, that's where you'll find all of your uh, marine fossils, for example. But there's a couple of other areas um, for the ocean biome. And one of those is the continental shelf. So the continental, a continental plate on which a continent sits doesn't get cut off exactly where the ocean comes to shore. Instead, it extends out under the ocean. So this is where the plate ends at the continental shelf. Um, so the neuritic zone is the water above the continental shelf and the intertidal zone is the area where the tide goes in and out. So from the lowest point to the highest point. And the abyssal zone, well, that's the deepest regions of the ocean floor. That's zonation. Lakes fall into two categories when it comes to how productive they are or how much nutrition there is in the lake. Oligotrophic, describes a lake that has low productivity. So here's an oligotrophic lake in Wyoming, but if you go into uh, Garibaldi or any of the more mountainous regions around here, you will find deep oligotrophic lakes. So they have low productivity. Um, they're rich in oxygen. They're usually very clear but partly because they're deep, but partly also because they're at altitude and the temperatures tend to be lower there, there's low productivity. A eutrophic lake, on the other hand, has high productivity and a lot of biomass, lots of dissolved nutrients, uh, but usually deficient in oxygen because the bacteria that's decomposing is using up all of the oxygen or much of the oxygen in a lake. So a eutrophic lake here in BC would be um, all of our urban lakes are eutrophic. A deer lake in Burnaby, right, right here where I live, Lost Lagoon. Very eutrophic, very, very nutrient rich. So there's tons of plant growth, as you can see here in our um, eutrophic lake. But you don't get plant growth like lilies and such in an oligotrophic lake. And the types of organisms that live there are quite different. So the types of fishes, for example, that you'd find in a eutrophic lake 
uh, would probably not be your salmon or trout. You would find fishes like carp. So carp have the capacity of getting energy by fermenting anaerobically as opposed to aerobic uh, cellular respiration. So you do find different organisms in the different types of lakes. Wetlands is kind of a general term. Um, it's not fully terrestrial, it's not fully aquatic. Um, they can be inland around lakes and low elevations. They can be quite swampy. They're known as swamps, for example. Um, they're known as marshes. So they are generally low elevations where the soil is inundated with water, so much so that the water rises above the soil. And streams and rivers we've looked at. Uh, usually a stream is in the headwaters, the higher elevation parts. Um, and the rivers are the lower, slower moving water. And estuaries are where fresh water and salt water mix. Um, how are they valuable? I'm going to cross this out. I'm going to say, can you name some estuaries in BC? Where fresh water and salt water mix. So this is a river flowing toward the ocean. Uh, but the ocean's tides are basically pushing up river. So what are some main rivers in BC? Do you know the names of any? Fraser. The Fraser River. Yeah, the Fraser River is a river that drains about a third of British Columbia. So it's a large river. And the estuary is all around us in Vancouver and Richmond and White Rock. So um, the salt water that the tide that comes into the Fraser, it goes up to about, I think, Mission. Mission feels the effects of the salt water tides. And so that's federally regulated. Uh, all fresh water in British Columbia is provincially regulated, but salt water is, is federally regulated. So the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is federal, and the Ministry of Fisheries is British Columbia. So how are they valuable? Well, if you imagine the Fraser River is draining a third of BC, that means that in any given watershed, um, that water is draining and moving silt and sediment into the Fraser River. And that's all moving downstream. And all of that silt and sediment contains loads of nutrients. And those nutrients end up in the estuaries. So they are highly productive for that reason. They are highly productive, so they have tons of invertebrates, and um, they end up being stopping off points for migratory birds. So many invertebrates, due to the high productivity, high productivity means those nutrients are taken up by plants. There's loads of plant growth, um, even algae growth, and starts this um, very complex food web or food chain that supports a lot of organisms. Yeah, so in this case, it's also um, estuaries are migrating. Bird stock. So birds that are migrating from the south toward Alaska, they stop here in Ladner and the other parts of the estuary, of course, for food. They're really super rich in food. And intertidal zones 
between the low tide and the high tide. So did we watch tides, did we not? We did, right? We watched tides, so that's good. Yeah. yeah, so we saw a little bit of that. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so the intertidal zone is very interesting because um, some, it's sometimes dry and sometimes covered in water. which means that the organisms there have to be adapted to both. So therefore, and we'll get more into intertidal organisms and intertidal zones when we do our, um, our lab on the 15th. The pelagic biome of the ocean is enormous, so large that it, it can um, provide habitat to extremely large animals, whales. Coral reefs is another kind of aquatic biome, generally close to a shore because, well, why is that? Why would coral reefs not exist out in the middle of the ocean? Is it because it's warmer and more shallow? Yeah, mainly it's more shallow. Yeah, so more shallow and must be in the photic zone. For the dinoflagellate symbionts. So the benthic zone is the bottom substrate of the ocean or lakes or rivers as well. They're all called benthic. Uh, the marine benthic zone, this is a hydrothermal vent community. This is the mid-Atlantic ridge. And there are some uh, tube worms that exist down there. And yeah. That is all I wanted to say about aquatic biomes, just to give you an introduction to them all. <laughs>